and a happy new year, everyone. Um, just, I have a question for you, by the way. You know the picture that's behind me? Uh, is it, uh, who is the author? Is it Van Gogh, or uh, Picasso, Renoir, or somebody else? No, the picture behind me. See, Eli, no, it's not Eli this time. <laughs> who, what it is? It's God. It's actually God who made this, by the way. This is, it's been like, uh, it become customary for us, for the message of the New Year, to show you this picture. And what are these things? These are the stars. These, we call this the star trails. How do they come about? By the way, we can't see them with the naked eye. So, but if you take a, 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 your camera and with open aperture for about maybe 10 to 15 hours, this is what you get. As if all the stars are kind of bowing towards God. Right? They're all there. And, and the, the, the point over there, the, last, the, the highest point is um, uh, the north, north celestial pole. You know? And what's interesting is that in the scriptures, uh, God seems to come from the north. You know, remember when Satan wanted to take over God, he says, I'm going to go over the, the, the north part of God. And also in Psalm 75, he says, for exaltation come neither from the east nor the west, nor from the south, but it comes from the north. Okay, so is the New Jerusalem there? Maybe. And how long do you think it takes for somebody to get there? Just forget about it. I mean, we don't even talk about this, right? Because it will take millions of years. But there's one person actually who went there and came back for us, and that's Jesus. It's in John 3:13, which says, "No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven." You see, salvation. You can get it by yourself. It's as hard as going right at the tip of that point, which is impossible. But the one who did it is Jesus Christ. And if you don't know Jesus, this is a great time for you to consider who Jesus is in the new year to come. So today we have a guest speaker. We have a guest speaker. It's Michael Gabizon. Michael Gabizon, most of you know him. He's, uh, he's already 22 years old. He's in uh, he's studying at a seminary in Trinity in Chicago. He finished his BA in, uh, at Bi Moody Bible Institute, and his wife is finishing uh, also her BA this year. Anna, where's Hannah? It's right here. Raise your hand. Okay, good. <laughs> and uh, Michael's going to speak to us about uh, uh, the new year and also um, a subject that he, he will bring, great subject that he will bring. So let's bow our head in prayer before I invite Michael to come up. Uh, Heavenly Father, we, we are so grateful for this past year. We are so grateful for all the souls, Lord, that came to believe. There were many, Heavenly Father, and we, are, we thank you for each and every one of them. And we pray, Lord of heaven and earth, that the coming year, 2012, will be a year of revival, of renewal for each and every one here. We pray, Lord of heaven, that, that thousands may will come to a saving knowledge of yourself. We pray for that revival. Be with us, Lord. Be with us and bless each and every one in this congregation. And be with Michael as he's bringing your word. In Yeshua's name that we pray. Amen. Shabbat shalom. Everyone can hear well? Great. Well, it's, uh, it's great to be here with you. Um, my wife and I, we flew in last Monday. So we've been here for about a week. And... Uh, Chicago doesn't yet have snow, so it's very nice to see the snow around. Uh, we don't actually get as much snow as Montreal does, though it does get just as cold, which is uh, hard to deal with, especially being on the lake. But it's nice to be in Montreal uh, for this time. So New Year's is a very interesting time. Um, whether, whether the Christmas season or the Hanukkah season was everything that we expected it to be, whether we had a family over, we had a lot of meals, or we had the holiday blues and uh, we were kind of let down. We're all kind of on the same page when it comes to New Year's because New Year's is a time where you're entering into a new season and you want to have change. And change is good, especially if it's for the betterment of our health or the betterment of our spiritual lives. But what's very important is that when we make change or when we make New Year's resolutions, we have to be very realistic when it comes to these decisions. I want to read a quote in a book called Christian Counseling by Gary Collins in reference to how people handle change. He begins by asking, have you ever made a New Year's resolution and given up a few weeks or maybe a few hours into the New Year? You're not alone. 
Researchers have discovered that 25% of New Year's resolutions are abandoned within the first week. 60% are gone within the first six months. Of those who fail, the majority will make the same resolution year after year for as long as 10 years before they either give up or finally succeed in making a change that lasts for at least six months. Those are discouraging statistics when we try to make change. But don't let that discourage you. Make resolutions. What I'm here to propose is that change, it doesn't come about by simply waking up and saying, I'm going to do this better, I'm going to do this differently. Change, as you see in the scriptures, it really comes with a change of mind. The whole idea of repentance, when God says to repent, repentance isn't mournful feeling, it isn't saying that, that you're very sorry for something, though it may be included, but repentance in its purest form just means changing your mind. When you repent, you make a 180 turn. And so in the same way, what I want to speak about today is a changing of mind, challenging a certain mindset which I see is prevalent within a lot of Christian men and Christian women. I entitled this Bible study, Pressing On Even When New Year's Resolutions Fail. To give you a little bit of context, I was recently speaking with a friend of mine, and we were talking about how Christian men, specifically because we cannot vouch for Christian women, though I would assume it's the same thing, Christian men, we have a hard time with guilt. We have a hard time with shame. That though we continue on in this life, we carry with us the burdens of things we've done or expectations we haven't lived up to. And we are kind of on cruise control when it comes to our relationship with the Lord. Uh, we're good with the Lord. The Lord is good with us. And we kind of just continue on looking forward to when we'll be with Him in eternity. And that's, a, that's a, the thinking I want to challenge because... In contrast to cruise control, I want to press on and continue going forward in this life, continue pursuing the Lord. I think I've shared this story a couple of times uh, when I've been up here, but when I went to New Brunswick Bible Institute, my first Bible college, I struggled a lot with guilt and with shame. I just couldn't believe that the Lord would forgive me. I wasn't feeling that forgiveness. So we're going to speak a little bit about that. Now, to illustrate the biblical truth, we're actually going to look to the first place in Scripture where man interacts with guilt and with shame. And that's found in Genesis. It's found in the creation narrative with Adam and Eve. So we're going to be looking at Genesis 1 through 3. Now, obviously, this is a big chunk of Scripture, and we're not going to be able to go verse by verse through it. But what we're going to do is kind of just like when you um, skip rocks across the water. It touches on certain things, but you know the direction it's going. In the same way, we're going to be touching on specific verses and seeing how the story develops. I'm not going to focus too much on the fall itself, but what I'm going to focus on is what Adam and Eve did after the fall, because that's what's really important. What do we do when things fall apart? How do we pick back up the pieces? So the first verse I'm going to read is found in Genesis 2.2. 2. Now, as we all know, we have the creation narrative here. God was creating the heavens and the earth, and he created it in seven days. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Genesis 2.2, we find the conclusion to the creation, and it says, By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Now, one of the first disclaimers I want to make is that while I do believe the world was created in seven days, in seven literal 24-hour days, I do not think that the purpose of Moses writing this was to give a scientific explanation for the creation of the world. I do not think that the children of Israel were necessarily struggling with that. Instead, when you look through Scripture, seven is a very symbolic number. Seven signifies completion. It signifies wholeness. Now, uh, we have to be careful because just because something is symbol laden, it has symbol in it, doesn't mean it didn't actually exist or happen. I do believe that the world was created in seven days, but the theological significance behind the world being created in seven days was that God did it, God did it in perfection. And not only that, but it says specifically here, and he rested on the seventh day. And we should clarify any, any primitive view of God's needing huffing and puffing and working and then sleeping after or something of that sort. We would think about Elijah calling uh, when he's challenging the uh, prophets of Baal and he's saying maybe your God is sleeping or he's off somewhere. 
This isn't the God of Abraham. He wasn't tired. So what does rest actually mean? When we follow rest throughout the entire scripture, it's kind of like an arrow shot all the way through. You find it in the beginning, all the way through until the end. Rest signifies spiritual restoration. And you see that as God is calling Israel back into the land in Deuteronomy, he says, enter into my rest, enter into my fellowship with me. You see it very beautifully in uh, 2 Samuel 7, when God is promising David that the Messiah is going to come from him and he's going to rule forever. And in 2 Samuel 7, verse 1, it says that David had rest from all his enemies. And then in 2 Samuel 7, 11, just 11 verses later, God says, I'm going to give you rest. So, you know, it's two different types of rest, a more theological, a more significant spiritual rest. So you see right in the creation narrative, right in the beginning in chapter 2, God created the world in perfection and he set a time apart for man to have spiritual restoration with him. God is a personal God. You see this right from the beginning. Now let's move on to the creation of man. Let's go down to Genesis 2.7, just a couple of verses later. In Genesis 2.7, it states, Then the Lord God had formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, within these first couple of chapters, in the first two chapters, we know a couple of things about the creation of mankind. First of all, man was created in the image of God. Now, what does that mean? The fact that man was created in the image of God shows that we are to mimic God. People call it, uh, people say that, that man has the communicable attributes of God, which merely means that we have the attributes which we are able to mimic. So, for example, God does not say, be all powerful for I am all powerful, or be all knowing for I am all knowing, but what he does say is, be holy for I am holy. So these attributes which we can do, that's what we're called to do. Being made in his image means we have the ability to do that. So not only are we made in his image, but he has given us the breath of life, meaning that our very existence is dependent on God. When we think about Ezekiel 37, specifically, I love it when it speaks about the, uh, the nation of Israel coming back in spiritual restoration. It's the dry bones. And what happened was that God breathed on them, and then they came to life. So in that same way, you see it here that God is the giver of life. So you have the fact that man was created in the image of God, that man's life is dependent on God, and that also in Genesis 2, it says that man named all of the animals. And the naming of the animals, we know that signifies the fact that he has authority over the animals. So it's, it's safe to say that man was a type of representative of God on earth. He was ruling the earth um, for the Lord. So from these things alone, we see that before we even come to the Garden of Eden, before we even come to the, the fall, God has created the world in perfection. He has created it as a personal God to have fellowship with man. And he created man to be his type of representative on earth, being made in his image. And then we come to the Garden of Eden in Genesis 2.15. Again, a couple of verses down. Now, th this is very interesting. There's a mention of the Garden of Eden before, and then there's some description of it in 10 to 14. But here, the author is saying the purpose of the Garden of Eden. And it says here, Then the Lord God took man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. Now, most of our translations will have to cultivate it and to keep it. But what's very interesting is that when you look in the Hebrew, for anybody who knows Hebrew grammar, your eyes will catch something that's, that's very unique. And um, this was brought out by Dr. Uh, John Salehammer, and it was reiterated by Michael Wexler from Moody Bible Institute. And uh, I really love the truth found here. While in, in grammar, um, this is very unique because to cultivate and to keep it refer to the garden. However, cultivate and keep are feminine, whereas garden is masculine. And that rarely happens. In Hebrew, it happens a couple of times in Jeremiah, but it really shouldn't happen. You shouldn't have these types of um, grammar clashes. And so what's proposed is that because vowels, Hebrew vowels, were added in later on in history in order to clarify certain points, it's the vowels that make it feminine. 
So once you take out the vowel, the gender class goes away, but the meaning also changes. And I just want to read to you what Dr. Wexler states in terms of uh, the gender class uh, clash. He says that the two words, to cultivate and to keep, should more appropriately be understood as worship and obey, because while both words individually can mean either of the terms, there is no place in Scripture where the two appear next to each other without the sense of worshiping and obeying God. So what he's saying here is that not only when you take out the vowels, not only does the gender class go away, but also these two words, whenever they appear together in the Torah, they're always in reference to worshiping and obeying God. So this would be an isolated incident if we keep it alone. And not only that, but the reason I like it is because it flows with the context. Because he says here, if this is the correct meaning, he says, Then the Lord God took man and put him into the Garden of Eden to worship and obey. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you will surely die. In, in the next verse, you have the first introduction to death. No one before ever heard of death, and now here God is giving stipulations. He's saying, I have placed you in the garden in order to worship and obey, to have fellowship with me. There's only one stipulation. Do not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Which I believe he's specifically speaking about spiritual death at this moment. Because physical death is reiterated later on after the fall. And so that's why I hold that it's more worship and obey because it goes in line only with the context, but the idea that um, God rested on that day, God rested and he created a context where man could have spiritual restoration with him. So our first two points here is that things are going well. Man has a good relationship with God. He's to worship and obey God. Man has a good relationship with the animals. He is able to rule over the animals and be God's representative. And then the third point in the creation narrative is meeting the woman. And I'm going to reference her as woman because uh, she's not yet named until the third chapter. This is the first time that God calls something not good when after Adam names the animals and God saw that he, he wasn't able to be with them. He said this is not good. He wanted to create a helper for the man. Now, before we get any derogatory term in terms of helper, any derogatory understanding that the woman is only a helper or something of that sort, it should be noted that helper frequently refers to God in terms of Israel, that God is Israel's helper. So if anything, it would indicate that the man needs help versus the woman only being a helper. That would be a, a more consistent understanding with Scripture. So she's, ter she's deemed a helper, and then uh, he creates... Uh, God creates Eve from the side, and then we see Adam's uh, first statement. He says, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And every time I read this, I always think of the cartoons when, when the, uh, an animal or a dog or something sees something he wants and his eyes go out and, and his heart's pumping in and out. He's excited that to, to have whatever it is. And so Adam, at this point, he's saying, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. You see the intimacy between Adam and Eve at this point. Adam and the woman, sorry. And, and then in verse 24 and 25, you see the conclusion. It says, for this reason, man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now the term joined, or usually cleave, as it's translated also, is used in reference to God, how we are supposed to act towards him. And it really demonstrates priority. It demonstrates a bonding. And you see the nature of their relationship. It says, And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. They, there was no shame in their relationship. There was a pure, intimate relationship between the two of them. And then the creation narrative kind of stops. And then you enter chapter 3. So, so far we have... Man's relationship with God, which is great. Man's relationship with the woman, which is great. And man's relationship with the animals, which is great. Okay, we could compare this to ourselves as like a mountaintop experience. Where, where your family's going well, the economics are going well, and you're not losing any money, anything of that sort. You're on the mountaintop experience where things with the Lord are going well. 
The big question is, what happens when you fall down into that valley? Because as this might be me being the diagram here, as I just illustrated, as man was with God, and man was with woman, and man was with the animals, when we, when we have sin introduced in the next chapter, all three of these are turned upside down, and all three of them are destroyed. You see that sin infiltrates every area. So let's see what happens when things fall apart. As we enter to the next chapter, there's really not much introduction given to the serpent. Um, it, there seems like a break because of our, our Bibles where chapters were added. Um, but there really isn't any introduction. You have the fact that they were naked, were not ashamed. This is now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And we know from Revelation that this serpent was Satan. Now it should be noted that the term crafty, we always think of it as a negative term, especially to our uh, English ears. But the, the Hebrew term could also be translated as prudent, and we're actually commanded to be like this in Proverbs 12. So what that illustrates is that while God can make something good, He can give you gifts, when you use them for things apart from His glory, they kind of go to waste. And here they were used against God. So it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, and he said to the woman, and I like to call this next, um, next section here um, hyperbolic section, because it's hyperbole after hyperbole. hyperbole. Sorry. And so he, he goes on here, and he, he first speaks with the woman. And he, he says to her, first a lie, he impl uh, implants doubt in her mind. And he says, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. Now, we know this is a complete lie because God said, Eat of any tree of the garden, just don't eat of this one. And Satan says, Didn't God say, Don't eat of any? So what he has done is he has turned God as a suppressor rather than a protector. As God gave instruction to protect them, he tried to show these rules being more suppressive. Now, Eve at this point should have uh, stomped on his head or something of that sort, and um, it, would, it would have been a proper response. Instead, she adds her own exaggeration. And she says, From the fruit of the trees and the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it, or touch it. God never said you shall not touch it. And so she adds her own exaggeration in here. So the entire time, both of them, while they're kind of speaking past each other, are turning God into a suppressor rather than a protector. And that's what sin does. It makes you lose focus of what God is doing. It's kind of like in, in reference to a lens. When you take a lens, when you start to blur it, that's what sin does to our perspective in life. It starts to mess with things. And then finally, we know what happens. It says that the woman took of the, of the fruit. And you see here in verse 6, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, which is the lust of the flesh, that it was a delight to the eyes, the lust of the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise, which is the pride of life, she took its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband and he ate. And hence you have sin entering into the world. So the first thing that we could see is that as, as man with God and man with woman and man with the animals, the first one was just flipped. Now the animals were starting to have dominion over the man. The animals started deceiving the man. So that first way that God was putting man in charge was just flipped. Now as we go to the second one, we see the relationship between Adam and the woman. And it says in verse 7, Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. You would question what happened in the seven verses. At seven verses before, they were naked and not ashamed to be with one another, and now they're trying to cover themselves up. There's a rupture in the relationship. And you also see this when God questions Adam, and he says, it's the woman you gave me. There's a rupture in their relationship, and the, the unity they had, they no longer share in the purity of it. There's a lot of debate as to what it means that their eyes were open, and they were able to, um, to know good from evil. And one of, the, uh, one of the conclusions that many believe is that this actually is in reference to judging right from wrong. 
that when their eyes were open, they started to usurp the authority of God in terms of deciding what is right and what is wrong. And you see the climax of this in Judges, when it says that everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And so you see that there's a rupture also with the authority of God. So the first one with the animals, that was turned upside down. The second one with man and woman, that was turned upside down. And now finally with man and God, you're going to see how sin affected their relationship. In verse 8 of chapter 3, it says, They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. As far as we know, this is the first time ever that man had to hide from God. In the very garden where man was supposed to worship and obey and have fellowship with God, man was hiding from him. And we see as we go on in verse 9, Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Imagine how thick the air would get. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And, and so the question, why, why would God say, where are you? Did God really know where they were? Of course. When I, when I speak about this, I bring up the illustration of um, <clears throat> when I was a little bit younger, and my father came down the stairs, and he came into the kitchen, and um, the chocolate was gone. And so he looked at me, and he said, Michael, did you eat the chocolate? I said, no. And I chocolate all over my face. <laughs> Obviously, he knew I ate the chocolate. But what he was doing was he was asking me so that I own it. Yes, I ate the chocolate. And in the same, oh, I mean, I said no. But in the same way, he's saying, where are you? And then Adam owned it. He said, I was naked and I was hiding from you. There was a rupture in the relationship. Everything God established, which was perfect, because God was in the center. Now we see that as man put himself in the center, judging what is right and wrong, Everything got flipped upside down. Now, as we come back to our own experience, we could look at Adam's experience prior to the fall and say that is our mountaintop. That, that is where we want to be. We want to be good with the Lord. We want everything to be going well. But the fact is things don't go like that. You have your valley moments. You have times when things fall apart. The question is, what do you do? And... Really, uh, it's kind of funny that, that we're taking the example of Adam and Eve and trying to act as they acted. But the truth is that the, the scriptures don't record them going on with shame. It doesn't record them beating themselves up about their actions. Instead, you see that they continued on pressing on having a hope in God. And we're going to see what really happens here. So as the narrative continues, God asks the man, what did you do? The man says, it's the woman's fault. The woman says, it's the snake's fault. Satan's fault, and then the judgment proceeds in that fashion. You have the snake, the woman, and the man. And with the snake, we have one of the most significant verses, which sets the tone for the rest of Scripture in Genesis 3.15. This really sets the stage for the rest of the Bible. And it says here, And I will put enmity, he's speaking to the serpent, and to Satan, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. What God is telling Satan at this point is that the woman is going to have a seed who's going to come, who's going to crush your head. God just gave Satan his death sentence. He just said someone is going to come and he's going to destroy you. And this, and as you, the, the term seed is used here. You're going to see seed all over the rest of the scripture because you're always tracing this seed. Who is the one who's going to come who we know is Jesus. So he makes this declaration to, uh, to Satan, and then he moves on to the woman. And to the woman, we know um, that first, birth pains are one of the judgment. And then a second thing, it says, your desire will be for your husband, in verse 16. And there's been a lot of debate. What does the desire mean? Is it psychological? Is it emotional? Um, I'm not exactly sure what it means. There's quite a bit of debate. But what we have to take into consideration is that this term desire is only used one other time in the entire Torah, and it's in the next chapter when um, God says to Cain that Satan it desires to overtake you. Its desire is for you. So it has negative connotations to it. But again, the judgment, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. You see a rupture in the relationship 
that, man, that God had created for man. And then finally you have in 19, he judges the man. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Which I believe is bringing up physical death. So he's saying that while I gave you this garden, while I gave you this land to fellowship with me, to cultivate it, to worship me, now you're going to have to work by the sweat of your brow as they are exiled out of the garden. And so judgment came. And now the question is, where do we go from here? This is an extremely significant question as it allows man to, um, to continue on with hope as we're entering into the new year. What Adam and Eve does is that they find themselves in the Lord. Okay, and we're going to see that in a second. They find themselves in what God has set up. They didn't find themselves in what they did. They didn't beat themselves up because of what they did. Instead, they saw what the Lord was doing and they jumped on board with it. So what did the Lord do? He judged Satan. And he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He knew that the, um, that the death penalty was coming. It was pending for Satan. So what did Adam do? We see his response in verse 20. It says, Now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. Now, if you were standing there, you would say, Adam, what is wrong with your thinking? Not only were you just promised spiritual death, you were just promised physical death, and yet you're naming your wife Eve. You're naming your wife Life, the mother of all living. Why? Because he understood God's promise, and that's what he was going with. He wasn't making his own way. He understood what God was doing, and he went with it. You see the same thing with Eve after they're exiled out of the garden, which is a great demonstration of grace. It says in Genesis 4.1, it says, Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Now, as uh, I'm sure many of you have interacted with this passage before, we know that in the Hebrew, with the help of isn't in there. And so what many people conclude is that Eve thought she was giving birth to Jehovah. She thought she was giving birth to the Messiah. So they say her theology was right. Her timing was a little off. But her theology was correct. Now, whether one accepts this or not, some people reject it because they say, well, there's no way that, um, that, that there would be such a distinction between God and man. And then she believes she gave birth to God or something of that sort. Regardless of which one you believe, it's an amazing thing that she gave birth to life, regardless of death, which was continuously promised before. So what this shows is that both Adam and Eve, after they, they had their mountaintop experience and they fell hard, they fell, with, which has ripple effects to the rest of eternity, they still got up and they didn't find their own way. They didn't just carry their burdens as they continue on life, waiting to die. Instead, they took action to find themselves in what the Lord was doing. And that's the way to pick back up the pieces, is to find yourself in who the Lord is and what he's doing. I shared a little bit before about my experience at New Brunswick Bible Institute and, um, and the, the, the guilt and the shame I was feeling. And it wasn't of anything that was out of this world. I just didn't feel forgiven. And I remember just staying up late and just praying so that the Lord would allow me to feel forgiven, that I could wake up in the morning and that I could feel better. It was distracting me from school. So eventually I went out with a counselor. We went out for a couple of hours and I just explained to him my whole story. And he recounted to me Peter's story. When Peter had the vision in Acts 10, he had the vision about the sheep with the unkosher animals coming down. And most of us know the story where he said to Peter to kill and to eat it. And Peter said, no way. This is unkosher food. I'm not touching that stuff. And it goes back a little bit. It goes back and forth. And then God says, don't you call unclean what I have made clean. And in the same way, the counselor said, don't you dare call yourself unclean when God has declared you clean. Because the entire time that I would suffer with my own shame and guilt, what I was doing while I wanted to kind of pull on the sympathy of God 
that he would forgive me and, and allow me to feel a mountaintop experience. What I was doing the whole time was usurping the authority of God to dictate my self-worth. And I was playing God myself, and I said, I'm not worth it. So in light of New Year's resolutions and a changed mind, my first point to really acting as Adam and Eve did after the fall is to forget about self-confidence because we're not that good. Have Christ confidence, Messiah confidence. Find yourself in who the Messiah is. If it says that God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son, that is what you trust in, not your own failures. And it, it takes a changed mind, but that's the first point. Having a Christ confidence. The second point, I know I've brought up here, but it has been my life verse, and I just love bringing it up because it's a great reminder to myself. In the book, Philippians, as Paul is writing to the church of Philippi, um, he says, starting in Philippians 3, verse 12, he says, not that I have already obtained it, or have already become perfect. So he's saying, I'm still on my pressing on motion. I'm still on my pursuing God. I have not obtained it. I have not come to completion. But I press on so that I may lay hold, of, so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. So the illustration is um, that just as Christ laid hold of Him, so continuously throughout your entire life, we try to lay hold of the Messiah. It is an ongoing process. And he says, brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. He has not been perfected. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. That's the second thing. And I know I used this illustration before, but life is, um, or this verse rather, is like a rear view mirror. I assume we've all driven or have been in a car. We all know that the rear view mirror is a very significant part of the car. It allows you to see what's behind you, where you're coming from. But anyone would be very foolish to be driving, looking in the rear view mirror the entire time. You wouldn't go forward. So in the same way, while looking back is good for reference points, you have to press on ahead. And you cannot let the past bring you down. Just like Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind, we're pressing on to what's ahead. So the first thing, having Christ's confidence, finding yourself in who the Messiah is. The second thing, forgetting the things which are behind. And then we have the third and final point. How to act like Adam and Eve did after the fall. And I want to premise this with saying, I don't know God's will for your life. Uh, whether, you know, what, what job you're supposed to take, who you're supposed to marry, uh, what house you're supposed to buy, anything like that. I could give you my opinion, uh, but I do not know his will in terms of those things. But in the same breath, I want to say I do know God's will for your life because he says it. And this is the goal we need to come with. Just as God had a will to bring the Messiah to crush Satan's head, Adam and Eve jumped on it. God has a will for your life, and we need to jump on that. And that's found in Romans 8. In Romans 8.29, it says... For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. That if you know the Messiah today, you have been predestined and you have been elected to become conformed to the image of his Son. It's amazing when you actually follow the image language throughout the Bible. Man was created in God's image. We're supposed to be like him. And then it says in Colossians that Messiah is the image of God. That it is God down in the flesh, and now we're commanded to be like, or in the image of, in the likeness of the Son. We're supposed to be conformed to His image, and that means having the communicable attributes, having those attributes that we can mimic, to be holy for He is holy, and to continuously pursue the Lord. That is how we pick up the pieces and continue on from there. So, as a short recap, man had it all good, Man with God, man with the woman, man uh, with the animals, and then everything was kind of shot to pieces with the initiation of sin because it wasn't God-centric anymore. And then from there, what did they do? They picked up the pieces by finding their future and their hope in the Lord. And that is what I challenge as a New Year's resolution for us. To no more find our future and our hope in ourselves and our self-worth. We have Christ's confidence. 
we continue to conform to the image and then we forget the things which are behind. Amen.